Uh, greetings, uh, Torian Ministry of Intelligence. This is uh, Mike Stanson from the Big Bull Mining LLC, currently stationed on Minion. We found something you should probably take a look at. While digging up a new vein, we stumbled across an old SLDF depot, old Star League Times, seemingly untouched. Uh, send back up, please. We're requesting specialists on encryption, engineers, and troops for protection. This could be one of the most important finds for Concordat security. Let them have this. Dispatch a level two and take care of it. Hello and welcome back. Today's game has been a long time coming, as you may have seen when I painted all of these. This time, we wanted to go a bit lighter on the rules explanation, switch it up from just bashing mechs into each other, and play an actual scenario this time. Which will also allow us to go more all-in on showing the fluff and narrative as it develops. After all, we're not doing anything fancy this time on the crunchy side of things. Ah, uh, well, actually, I've taken the opportunity to set up a little experiment. Only one side is going to rely heavily on mechs this time. This video is going to be about heavy duty tanks versus heavy duty mechs. Let's find out if a weapons platform actually needs to have legs, or if mundane tanks can't do just as well, if not better. Oh, uh, and why did I paint these? Oh, these are just the Torian scout mechs. You see, for the setting I thought we could dip back into the succession war times, say 30-25? and show one of the instances when Comstar tried to keep lost technology from being rediscovered. You see, there is this SLDF depot- oh, Wait, wait. Maybe we should take a step back and explain why the Galaxy's telephone company would ever decide to weigh in on some periphery state digging up an ancient military base. That's probably for the best. History lesson? History lesson. To understand the cause of our little skirmish in the year 3025, we need to go on a little excursion into history and back to the years around 2780. It was the end of the Star League, and what an end it had been. In quick succession there had been a war, followed by an even more devastating civil war, where a usurper had risen to head of state and subsequently was fought and overcome by the standing military the legendary Star League Defense Force. But even after decades of intense fighting came to a close, the Throne of Terror was unoccupied and, with the Great Houses all casting greedy glances at it, the first signs of the oncoming First Succession War were already on the horizon. But there were those few who tried to preserve some of what the Star League stood for. And two of these would set in motion a chain of events that leads up right to our current conflict. First, and never least, there was Alexander Kedensky, former commander of the Star League Defense Force, or SLDF, whose most important decision in the oncoming conflicts was not to participate. Rather than become the most powerful force in the inner sphere, he decided to remove himself and his war-weary soldiers from the equation. They rustled up a fleet of faster-than-light ships, loaded them with supplies and what they couldn't take, they carefully hid away to ensure that no one would use their hardware in yet another senseless war. Then they headed off into deep space and disappeared from history for a few centuries. But there was also Jerome Blake, the SLDF's head technician, who had quite a different vision of how to set things right. He stayed behind rebuilt Terra and took the network of hyperpulse generators under his wing, thus controlling the only means of FTL communication, founding Comstar and holding a powerful monopoly from there on forth. And so Comstar declared themselves a neutral party and kept the stars connected. And would Blake just have been a shrewd businessman? That would have been the end of it. But he was also a visionary. He was sure that human nature would continue to instigate a series of escalating wars until humans were either eradicated or culture and technology had declined back to a less stellar level. 
So he collected, recorded and preserved what advanced technology he could lay his hands on and made sure Comstar would continue to act as humanity's hidden curators. Whatever his real intentions were, due to his seclusive nature they became twisted, misinterpreted and taken advantage of in the years to come. Comstar became more and more of a religious cult with Blake's supposed vision at the center. It is assumed that Blake had hoped to preserve knowledge, to share it with mankind when needed. What Comstar got from this was the following. Humanity is doomed. The great houses will enter perpetual war until they are weak and have fallen into barbarism. Then Comstar will open its gates, send out its troops, conquer the inner sphere and shine the light of its knowledge onto the downtrodden masses. Which might sound like a nice plan, but whenever the great houses started to slow their eternal warmongering or began to rediscover lost technologies, Comstar was right there, in the shadows, ready to make sure Jerome Blake's predictions would prove true, even if there needed to be a prod or a shove to keep things going downhill. And now imagine the present day. Year 3025. A few lowly Torian miners find one of the hidden legendary SLDF depots filled not only with military supplies but also computer hard drives that could potentially contain countless lost blueprints and might propel the periphery state of the Torian Concordat years ahead in technology. Excited as they are, they send the news via Comstar's highest priority comms network, never imagining who would listen in and take note. So that's the mission, is it? Collecting the old SLDF data before the Torians can make use of it? Yes, that's what we call an extraction mission. Uh, you will have to designate a secret hex within four rows of my map edge as your target. One of your mechs will then need to stop there to make a pickup. Is that why you have all the fast moving mechs which would be good for this and I just have big slow beefy boys? That's so you don't have it too easy. And as an additional challenge, we're also going to play using the forced withdrawal rule. We'll explain the specifics once it kicks in, but broadly speaking, if a mech or vehicle gets too damaged, it'll start pulling back since it doesn't want to get killed. Okay. Um, shooting rules as per our usual? Yes, we write down targets at the end of the movement phase and then shooting happens all at the same time. We just kind of go randomly for die rolls there. You also mentioned that it's going to be all about tanks versus mechs this time and I see the Torians added six tanks to their numbers but we don't have the correct models for these so I can't see what these are. Yes, uh, sorry about that but these are demolishers. They're armed with twin AC-20s and cream everything up at close range. While the yellow boys are Shrek PPC carriers. As the name implies, they're armed with a trio of PPCs and pick off targets at range. They're a classic pair really. And as per standard Torian military doctrine, one vehicle lance is organized in three maniples, which is two vehicles each. I just found it poetically fitting to fit six tanks versus six mechs, which are obviously in a Comguard level two. And speaking of which, the Comguard's briefing should be starting any second now. Let's just tune into that and let them explain who they are and what they want. Everybody here? Right. Then we can begin. Comstar has decided that a mission this important requires a full level 2, 6 battle mechs, all heavy machines in this case, so we are going all in. You know the broad strokes already, here's the specifics. The old SLDF depot uncovered by the miners is located in a mountain range here. Our spy has collected the hard drive Comstar high ups are worried about, but they have no way to get it off planet or even off site themselves seeing how Torian transport ships are the only thing leaving into orbit and the perimeter is being patrolled by Torian military. 
Lucky for us, the planet is an old battlefield and has suffered severe orbital bombardment during Star League times. Why is that good for us? Lingering radiation. Infantry would need special protection and thus won't factor into things. Now, Intel suggests that the spot with the least security is a plateau north of the main facility. Our spy has been able to deploy the package in one of the old burnt out craters there. We will be dropped slightly north of the position to collect it. The Torians are likely to make us out early enough to mount some sort of hasty defense. We suspect an encounter about here where the plateau narrows. We will have cliffs and woods to protect us up to there. But from there we need to cross open terrain marked by old craters. That's the death zone. So what's the plan? First things first. You have already received your new call signs for the mission. We're using a comm scrambler as per standard procedure, but just in case they record our radio chatter, we will want them to cast their suspicions on their neighbors instead of us. We're using tech they've probably never seen before. So, if Davian were to field experimental tech, it would likely originate from the new Avalon Institute of Science, which is named for the planet it's based on. And since the name Avalon has roots in Arthurian folklore all the way back from medieval terror, we are naming ourselves after Knights of Legend this time. Knights of Legend? Hmm, I like the sound of it. Glad you approve. The package will be referred to as the Grail from now on, and its carrier will be the Grail Knight. Just to clear that up. Galahad and Percival will be said Grail Knights. With Galahad being plan A and Percival taking the Grail if Galahad should get sidetracked. You will be running a Thunderbolt and a Battlemaster. I'm going by Pan Dragon and fielding a Cyclops. A command from the front trying to back you up as much as possible whilst I coordinate the team. Gawain and Lancelot with their Black Knight and Thug will be providing long range support and push forward only when called upon. Finally, Riston. Your awesome is equipped with enough LRMs to level a small outpost, but I will probably ask you to set up a bit of a flank and be ready to go in if things get hairy. As for opposition, be advised that there is a quick response mech lance on site. We've identified them as Rapturesers, contract mercs that have been a mainstay in the Torian forces for years now. What kinds of mechs are we talking about here? At this site? Scout machines mainly. Locust, spider, that sort of thing. But the local lance commander has been known to use a Shadowhawk. Apart from those, we might run into whatever vehicles they can get into position quickly enough. Probably tanks, as the approach to the battle zone is impossible for hovercraft and problematic for wheels. That's one reason we chose this specific pickup spot. But we might not run into any at all. Let's just hope for the best on that. Right? That's all. Dismissed. Reactor online. Sensors online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. Battlefield surveillance online. Calculating topographical data. Target. Acquired. You That's won that handily. Twelve. <laughs> right, so I have to go first. You do have to go first, and I have to move one. Since extraction missions revolve around transporting a target to your side of the map, we quickly want to point out the home map edges. This is a double map, so there would be six potential edges. In this case, however, the Torian map edge is here and the Comstar map edge is here. This is also where we are allowed to move troops onto the field. The Comstar troops begin to assemble in the northern woods. The Torian tanks use the southern woods as cover while setting up a firing line. 
the open plains dividing both positions are sure to become a slaughterhouse in the coming minutes. For now, the level 2 isn't sure if they've been fully spotted, so comms chatter is, as of yet, kept to a minimum. Tristan, break off and circle around. We don't want to be too clumped up on approach. Roger, Pendragon. Moving out. Tristan's awesome ducks behind the cliff, breaking up the advancing forces. The Torians wisely react by sending the fast-moving mechs of the Red Chasseurs to set up a flank on the western side of the plateau. The field commander's Shadowhawk moves to reinforce the Torian tank wall, where he could coordinate their fire and be ready to move in, take advantage or run interference if need be. I'll take the high ground to get some more view. Acknowledge Gawain. Gawain in his Black Knight moves up the northern rock formation, putting it in a position to overlook most of the battlefield, ready to side with Tristan or join the Com Guard's main advance going forward. And I'll complete my parking lot. One, two, three, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Runs are set up. All right, that's movement done. Movement done. Let's get to shoot stuff. Galahad, take some probing shots at those woods. Arrange missiles smoothly. Ready to light a few bonfires. I'll see if I can spook that shadow hawk. Ready? Fire at will. Let's see if that gets a reaction. Whoa, whoa, I'd say that's a reaction. Typical Torian greeting. Torian greeting? It means, get off our damn lawn, turn back punks, or else. <laughs> Charming. Even though no shots connect, the battle has begun. Let's see who gets to go first. You do. <laughs> That's me again. With the Torians waiting for the unmarked strangers to do so much as twitch, the Com Guard moves first. Black Knight and Awesome take positions up on the cliff to cover their comrades' advance, but the Ratchesers don't plan on giving them any room. With jump jets blazing, the spider boxes them in towards the west whilst using woods as cover. Percival, join up on Galahad. You are all Grail Knights. Move to the edge of the woods and prepare to make a break for it. You realize there's no cover going forward, only a lot of tanks. I do. Lancelot, stay back, provide fire support. I'll join up with the advance. One of us should be able to reach the target. One of us? Well, there are some AC-20s pointed our way. The Regisseur Lance Commander calmly stands his ground, coordinating with the tanks as they quickly agree on targets and lock them in. The Spider proceeds to show off some amazing piloting as they put a shot in the awesome, despite only just touching down after the jump. Woo! That hit! Go Spider! <laughs> Not that the big machine can't take it. Still. That tiny bugger actually got me. Careful, these aren't amateurs. The other mechs can't quite repeat that feat. Okay, so that were my mechs. I love my little spider. Um, now the tanks. Let the tanks do what the tanks do. The shots go wide at first, but then 
That's a 10, an 11, and a 7. Oh crap. Keep that off comms, Gawain. Ah, uh, no such luck. Just because it's my favorite make. Despite the hit, Pendragon keeps his comms dutifully silent. Take shots at those demolishers if you can. I don't want any of those AC-20s connecting. Let's see how they like it. The Torian comms flare up with chatter. Not one of the soldiers has ever seen a weird pulsing weapon like that before. On the other side of things, Gawain checks his scanners to see what damage he caused. What have we got? Oh, you've got to be kidding me. One, two, three. I have thirty. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This one only has twenty. No. No. Uh, yep. I wonder if it was even worth shooting at those. <laughs> Demolishers are very, very sturdy. That's why you usually pair them with the very much more fragile tracks. I should have focused those. Alright, Gawain has set the bar. Let's see some results here. Fire! More shots find their target. Leaving Demolisher 3 heavily bruised, but far from finished. How about you get out of my way? Tristan tries to dissuade the Regisseurs from blocking the Awesome's path and peppers the Wolverine with its long-range weaponry, softening the mech up as this round of salvos comes to an end. Nothing incapacitated after all of that? That's... that's bad. It certainly seems that way at first, but the sheer amount of impacts makes more than one mech sway and... So, for the Black Knight, it needs a 6 plus to keep standing. Come on. That's a 7. That's keep standing. And uh, the Cyclops, likewise. That also stays upright. And my Wolverine. The Wolverine goes to ground. One Wolverine down, that's not quite what I hoped would happen, even though I did hope for Max to fall down. Okay, I go first. For once. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I dislike this so much. They can stay dug in, but we're on a timer before reinforcements arrive. We need to move. Roger, stepping off the high ground. Well, can't hide in the trees forever. Going for it. Seeing the Thunderbolt move in on his position, the fallen Wolverine can't afford to stay down. I'm going to run. Screw being cautious. Eight movement points, standing up attempt. It's a plus zero, I believe. I think so. That's an eight, I cleared it anyway. Yeah. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. The Red Chasseur Commander asks his advance scouts for information and the Wolverine's pilot looks at his scanner as it analyzes the enemy mech. What's that armed with? The Thunderbolt. Three mediums? Three medium lasers, two machine guns, one SRM-2, one large laser, one SRM-15. Everything. It's armed with everything. If you don't want that cover, I'll happily take it. Just. Sliding down. Mm -hmm. The Torian Fireline keeps to their spots. Mm. Two can play that game, huh? Galahad, I'm coming up on 
Junior 10. Happy to have you. As the unknown mechs begin to move past, the Shadowhawk decides that he needs to keep them within sights. And thus, the jump jets roar to life. Not to be outdone or ignored. Is that spider actually coming at me? The light machine touches down on top of the cliff's edge, right behind the descending awesome. Percival, Gawain, Lancelot, keep those tanks suppressed whilst we're moving past. Those things are sturdy as they are. The Wolverine is cutting me off. We've got to do target locked in. One D6. One. One destroys the SRM six. And five. Reroll. Three. That's the ammo. Oh boy. A critical hit on ammunition. Finally, we get to show off one of the flashiest events that can happen on any Battletech table. Unless noted otherwise, stored ammunition is explosive. If it is hit with a crit, it acts accordingly. It explodes! Which means that you get to add up all the damage that ammunition would cause if you were to fire it at an enemy and instead apply it to the internal structure of the location where it has been stored, most likely destroying it. Now, if the location is protected by case, cellular ammunition storage equipment, then that's where it ends. But we're in succession war times, so storing ammo carefully is not exactly standard procedure right now. And so, if there is any excess damage after the location has been destroyed, which is likely, it spills over into the internal structure of the next location. You can see how this could mess up a mech quite badly. The only saving grace here is that ammo explosions don't automatically chain explode all other stored ammo. They may cause additional crits though. Also, case or no case, the explosion sends an electrical shockwave to the pilot's neurohelm and they take two damage no matter what else transpires. Now, the Wolverine still has 14 shots of SRM6 ammo left. That adds up to... Uh, 14, 2, 6 missiles per shot. Out here. Ha! Nice shooting! My shots didn't even connect! <laughs> so is with a smile. Now grab us a grail. My turn! Let's start off with the heroic last efforts of the Wolverine. As he sees the large laser already lighting up his cockpit, the Wolverine's pilot still manages to press down the fire buttons. With the impending doom heightening their senses, all of the shots connect. Darn! That crippled my right arm! Hey, comms discipline, boss. At that moment, the commander orders concentrated fire on the exposed and still reeling Cyclops. Shit! Entitled to a little cursing. Hey, are you still holding up? That could have gone so much worse. Left arm's useless as well. Right leg behaves wonky. I think I got internal into three limbs, right? Yes, so that's crippled. It's going to start withdrawing now. And suddenly, the Wolverine gets some unexpected payback. Tristan, you all right? Ah, that feisty bastard! I don't believe it. Hit my cockpit mid-jump. Damage assessment. 
Windshield is a fixer upper and I've got a spiral in my rear now. I need to make two piloting skill rolls for the Cyclops and I need to put every modifier that accounts for this phase into the roll. So it is plus one for taking 20 damage and plus one for a destroyed leg actuator, which means I roll at sevens and I do that two times, once for the destroyed actuator and once for the 20 plus damage. So I need to roll two sevens here. First seven is done. Go. Second and is also good. You stay upright. Smoldering, falling to bits, but upright. Yeah. Right, new turn, new initiative. New turn, new initiative. Seven, so you go first. I go first. My mech is coming apart at the seams. I've got to pull out. I've got one mech that's crippled. Mm -hmm. So it will start to retreat. Mm -hmm. And with that, it's time to talk about forced withdrawal. This is a fluff rule that we decided to include this time. As the entry in the rulebook states, it is rather uncommon for military forces to battle to the point of utter destruction. Rather, they will retreat at some point. And that's precisely what we're trying to include here. Forced withdrawal kicks in once a unit counts as having suffered crippling damage. Once it has, it needs to start moving towards its own table edge. This isn't simulating utter panic, so it doesn't need to run at full speed and it can even move backwards. It just needs to start heading towards safety. These are only guidelines though, the details are for the game master to decide or the players to agree on. This is a fluff rule after all, so you should just go with what fits the story. But what counts as crippling damage? A mech is crippled if either of the following things happens. A side torso is destroyed. It takes two hits on the engine and or the gyro. Loss of sensors. At least three limbs have suffered internal damage. Or at least two torsi, but only if the front armor has gone on them as well. It suffered four or more pilot hits. Or if all of the mech's weapons are destroyed or out of ammo. For vehicles, it's a little simpler. Either all armor lost on one location, or all weapons destroyed. In the case of my poor, poor Cyclops, both arms have suffered internally, as has the right leg. Quite a few critical hits have happened as well, but at this point those aren't even necessary. Three limbs damaged internally. Back to my table edge it is. Slowly. Don't turn around now. I haven't forgotten about that tank line and I'm neither suicidal nor panicking. Just slowly moving back. Also, someone needs to keep an eye on you hotshots. For now I'll keep an eye on you before they shoot you to pieces. Tristan, get a move on and swap in for me. Why is every light on the planet out for my rear armor? It's a nice big target. Your face is a nice big target. Glad we established that. The Shadowhawk decides it has done enough damage to the Cyclops and jumps back to its previous command post. There's an opening. Percival, move in. Now or never. But just after the Shadowhawk is done repositioning, Demolisher 1 breaks out of the tank line to cut the advance off in place of the downed Wolverine. Assisted by Shrek 1. Great. Now I need to take the long way around. Careful. More of them coming our way. 
Right then, that's movement. That's movement. Let's get to shooting. I can't get these signies out of my bag. How's the damage? Ah, uh, negligible. Then you'll just have to deal with it. We've got bigger problems. They found Lancelot, for example. No relevant damage. Thankfully, these tanks can aim. You had to say it. You just had to say it. Yeah, there's a reason why the Cyclops is not a very point costly mech, despite its weight. The Torian tank line finally have their targets within optimal range. And they're ready to show the mech pilots why common tanks are not to be underestimated. Hey Percy, you dropped something. Fuck you! Right, we need to take out those tanks or this little stroll will be over before we know it. Concentrate fire on the demolishers, I don't want to see a single AC-20 pointed at us going forward. Now, a lot of focus on Demolisher 1, which is pristine and untouched, but in the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly why I put it there. Ha! Motive system hit! That'll slow it down. Sadly, it is exactly where it wants to be and that turret turns 360 degrees. So, we still need to finish it off. Are you trying to dig a trench around it or something? <laughs> I'd like to see you do better. There you go. Lucky bastard. Well, that one can't move now. After the barrage of shots, the better Cyclops reels. But it keeps upright. Just keep standing. Just keep walking. Just keep walking. <laughs> Aha, take that. How much damage? Four glorious points. Lights are starting to really annoy me. Well, bring them over here where the tanks are shooting us to pieces, and then we'll help you. Well, Well, <laughs> I have to go first. That's you nice. have to go first. Uh, all right. The Cyclops keeps moving away. Let me get that for you. As they put over here. Copy. We could use some backup though. Lancelot, join up. Joining. As the tanks just shuffle into slightly better firing angles, Percival's Battlemaster keeps moving towards the objective. With the Thak abandoning the firing position on the eastern plateau, the Shadowhawk storms out of his command spot and flanks the Comguard's advance. 
And that demolisher keeps lapping at my heels. Can't you shake it off? No room to... You know what? Time to stop it. Tin can! Like that's gonna go well. You're going to get a good shot at this mech anyways. Yeah, that's true. No, perfectly acceptable. And this way you can kick me. If I keep standing. The Locust suddenly kicks into high gear. The Spider's jump jets fire, and before anyone can process what happened... How did that light get behind me all of a sudden? That's what I was gonna ask. Yeah, see how that goes. Less trash talk, more fire support. Copy. Moving into optimal missile range. The Red Chasseur's light mechs open fire, causing some scratches to the Thunderbolt, Black Knight and, in an impressive display of marksmanship, also the Thug. Bunch of impacts. Nothing the stabilizers can't handle. But the Lance Commander makes it his personal mission to stop any and all reinforcement of the front lines, turning the Shadowhawk's weaponry on the Thug's rear. With some good shooting, but nothing a mostly untouched heavy mech couldn't handle. That's a lot of weapons on that thing. AC5, medium laser, SRM2 and LRM5. I mean a lot of different weapons on that thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, tanks. Now the stuff I'm afraid of. Be impressive. Both Battlemaster and Thunderbolt sway under the high caliber shots of the demolisher tanks. Then the Shreks light up the battlefield with their PPCs. Press my arms. The number AC-20 is gone as well. We only got an SRM launch left. Now what are you waiting for? Eject! That's a negative. I've still got sensors, so I'm still in command. Also, I've just become a low-priority target. We'll put that on your tombstone. Again, my side torsi. Can't you hit my CT, you idiot? I've got plenty of armor left there. Too much. This is too much. I'll have to pull out. It's on you, Galahad. I think this thing is also in retreat now. Both Torthy stripped or internal damage? Internal damage on both. Okay, then it's forced retreat, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so return fire. Just keep providing covering fire. Learn to aim. I'm happy enough I'm still walking. That was my last AC-20 shell. Hey, I think you jumped a turret. I'd be happier if it wasn't still pointed at me. Hits, but I don't think we put anything down. At least they didn't either. <laughs> Jinxed it. Did you just manage to not step on the tank? I was dodging a berserking light, okay? Initiative. Initiative. So, you go first. Sadly, yes. Can't believe that thing is still upright. <laughs> it never fell. Don't want to alarm anyone, but that Shadowhawk is slowly moving into our back. Let it. It's not what I'm worried about right now. Ooh, back on my feet! Can you come and support? Are you kidding? I'm getting out of here. Got red lights all over the cockpit. Who hasn't? Those tanks don't give an inch. Tristan, move in. We need a new Grey Knight. Let's 
Lancelot, fire support. And would you kindly use your full firepower now? What do you mean, full firepower? Keep it like that and finally utilize its double heat sinks, which I didn't see. This is an inner sphere pilot in a Comstar mech, so... He probably just read the uh, listing for you have this many heat sinks and wondered why his mech wasn't getting hotter. Yeah. Double heat sinks. Live and learn. I need to get rid of stuff. There's still so much stuff. You know what? Screw that locust. I'll keep supporting from here. It can't melt off my rear that fast. And there's your epitome. That's it! I'm going for the prize! Careful! Demo 1 is trailing you! So, that's movement done. Shooting! Excuse me, I'm noticing the locust behind me is standing still and taking aim. Did you just say you could take that? What I'm saying is, the light is standing still. Oh, Roger. Kristen, assist me. How do you miss something the size of a small house? You know, I blame the fact that my control panel is shooting sparks at me. Fair point. Also, stop complaining, do better yourself. <laughs> yeah, you do that. I'm reading another weapon malfunction. Until they fix that, Demo 1 is out of the game. Right, can't let Gawain have all the glory. Demolisher 1 has taken quite a beating throughout turn 5 and 6. It has suffered 3 critical hits, weapon malfunctions on both of its AC-20s and a turret jam. These are conditions which are unique to vehicles. The turret jam means the turret can't be turned anymore and is stuck in its lastly used position, straight ahead in this case. And the weapons can't be used for the time being. All of this is damage that can be repaired though, unlike Weapon Destroyed or Turret Lock, which are the same but irreversible. Vehicles, unlike mechs, have an onboard crew which can do maintenance even in the midst of battle. Green can forego shooting on any coming weapons phase and instead have the tank crew fix one of its problems, slowly making the tank useful again. Because as it is, it's a metal box on tank treads. found all the fire buttons. Double heat sinks. So, let's start again with my beloved spider. It's kind of heating up, which is why I'm giving it a turn to cool down and rip out a tree to use as a club. Percival, I think the spider behind you just ripped out a tree. A tree? Oh, you can do that. You can. <laughs> um, it doesn't really do anything. It's a normal melee attack, kind of like a kick for the same damage as a kick, without the whole falling over if you miss. Which is still pretty cool. Yeah. The red chasseurs begin to show some battle fatigue as both Locust and Shadowhawk miss almost all of their shots. It is up to the tanks to pick up the slack once more. Race for impact! Damage report! I'm traveling light from now on. 
That was a lot of stripped armor. Piloting checks. Um, the fuck? Yep, go. Keep standing. Yep. The awesome keeps standing. And now the one that's important, the thunderbolt, keeps standing. Standing on the thingies. The grail is in hand. I repeat, the grail is in hand. So I managed to pick it up. Nice. Now to just get it out of there. Keep calm. We're not out of the woods yet. I'm still reading nine PPCs total and three angry mechs. All right. All right. Let's go. Turn seven. Initiative. Initiative. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you go first. New objective. Begin exit strategy. Oh, I'm exiting, all right. But the Torians seem to notice the change in strategy almost instantly. I'm going to do what no Shrek has done before. Looks like they're not letting us off easy. Oh, they know. One, two, three. Oh, no. Are you mental? We're moving out, not in. They got PBCs. Those suck at close range. And they know it too. Huh. In that case. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm entering the space with your tank because I can do that. Okay. Not to interrupt, but I want a Grey Knight that actually has some armor left. Gawain, say no more. Finally, I'm starting to play Blood Bowl here. Spider at my rear! Spider at my rear! The Locust is gonna attempt to flank someone too. Lancelot, cover me. As long as you cover me too. That was the idea. He's also going for personal. Alright, shooting face. Shooting face. Ganging up on me, eh? Surprise! Two lasers out the rear at the spider. Damn it! I forgot. You headshot a light out the arse? Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'm down with that. Everybody else, cripple the track so we can get out of here. One more down. Show off. I soften that up. That should mostly cover our retreat. Lancelot, kindly open up the way out. Opening. Let's hope that scares him off. Etorian? Not likely. Sadly true. Looks like you made the little guy mad. Ha! Let him! I'm pumped now! Come at me! Meanwhile, the Torian commander has had time to ponder what this attack was actually about. The bolt moved forward by the thunderbolt. How it seemed to pick something up. The Black Knight purposefully approaching the ailing mech. And the Cyclops' constant intense comms trapper. That Shadowhawk doesn't seem to scare to me. And it has a way too good idea who not to let pass. Looks like we need to take care of it after all. 
can't take much more of this. No stumbling now. Keep walking towards me. Ah, uh, my leg! Percival down! I need backup now! I have no one to spare. That's a lot. Maybe you can. But before Pen Dragon can finish the thought, the spider tosses aside its tree, jumps onto the downed Battlemaster, lifts its foot, and brings it down onto the left torso. Okay, so I get two critical hits. upper lower bracket. Mm -hmm. That's upper bracket. Six. That's MG ammo. What was that? What happened? So. We've talked about ammo explosions before, but that didn't include what happens if one mech sticks a foot right into another mech's bullet storage. And to be honest, we didn't find a quick answer on that. We didn't even find any rule about it at all in our printed copy of Total Warfare, which meant we had to dig deeper. What we finally found was an optional advanced rule in Tactical Operations, page 78 if you're curious. It goes as follows. For all units in the same hex as the exploding mech, divide the damage caused by 10. So for our 200 shots of MG ammo, that would amount to 40. Apply that as a 5 damage cluster hit, just as if this had been a missile weapon. So it would have been 8 hits. For units in adjacent hexes, it would work the same, but at half damage. Of course, this is the rule for a mech standing close to the exploding mech, not for someone sticking their limb right inside it. But all of that is hypothetical anyways, as we didn't want to interrupt the game flow for an impromptu library deep dive to research all of this, so we had no clue about the proper ruling at the time. We just went with what felt cinematically appropriate and decided that the spider was out due to sudden loss of legs. Percival's gone. I knew that Spire was bad news. Crazy bastard. Can't see it anymore though. Scanner says it's still there. On the ground. Minus the legs. Grail handed off. Grail in hand. And there's our silver lining. Let's get out before we lose anyone else. Initiative. Initiative. You win that handily. Alright, let's not drop the ball on this. Demolisher is showing life again. Don't get distracted. Galahad, go for it. You've got the most damage. Set the pot to the candle. Locust moving in on Lancelot. You just focus on being the Grail Bearer. Roger. Shrek 2 is taking aim. Discourage it. On it. Everyone, brace for another salvo. Whilst the Locust tries in vain to punch through the thug's rear armor, the Shadowhawk takes aim once more, now dead set on at least stopping the enemy's two most valuable assets. Boss? You're still standing? Blind luck. That went past everything important. That's when the commander remembers he still has troops at his disposal. And since he can't be sure the suspected handoff between Thunderbolt and Black Knight wasn't faked, it got my leg! Armor breakthrough, no damage. Damn to 
disorient. Don't know when to stop. They really don't. <sighs> Looks like. Gawain, Galahad, help me clear the way. No dice. Nothing relevant. Eye for an eye, leg for a leg! Just try not to break anything when you fall down yourself. Way forward is clear. Tristan, Lancelot, shut up those tanks. Gladly. Tank shut down. Nice face plant, get ahead. Are you still with us? Just don't run off without me. Now, that's just spiteful. Roll it again. You go first. Demolisher won't be able to pursue. Shadowhawk is down. Needs the locust and one last Shrek. I'm on the Shrek. Well, one, two, three. Everybody else, just move the objective. Safely. You know what, I'll go for broke, these are Torians after all. As the Torian commander sees the Black Knight move past, carrying whatever the attackers had been after, he pushes the controls and struggles to get up. Once... Shadowhawk just won't give up. Turning to the other side again. Come on, just stay down. Twice. So the Thunderbolt needs to try to stand up. I believe so. Alright, let's give that a try. I'm up again. Then drag your carcass out of here. Lancelot, cover us. Roger. Don't believe it. They're still trying to cut us off. From a final spiteful shot, the Torian guns fall silent. The wretch as her commander is hanging in the straps of his piloting chair, whole body aching. The last demolisher's crew is on the retreat. None of the other tanks are still operational. The spider's pilot is already on the walk back to camp. Only the locust is still aching for battle. So the commander puts out a final message. All remaining Torian forces, this is the commander. Cease fire, stand down. It was directed as much at the enemy mechs, as well as his last able pilot. Finally. Drinks are on me when we're back home. Orderly retreat. Tristan, Lancelot, fall in line. Get to the rendezvous point. Lancelot? 
I'm taking a little detour. Could use a lift. Is that you, Percival? Got injected. In time. Got eyes on him. Then pick him up before the radiation microwaves him. Then we're truly done here. Good work, everyone. And with that, our team of Comguard soldiers begins to relax. The White Max board their dropship and take with them another piece of an age lost long ago, quietly leaving our story. The Torians would never find out who it was that robbed them of their prize or what it had actually entailed, whether it was warship blueprints or just a guide on urban mech maintenance. Of course, this conflict would be rendered pointless only a few years later in 3028, when the Helm Memory Core is found and spread around the Inner Sphere by the Grey Death Legion. Subsequently, the Federal Suns get their hands on a copy and make countless lost technologies available once more, ironically at the very new Avalon Institute of Science that had served as Comstar's scapegoat today. And that's another game of Battletech finished. Certainly was a long one. Yes, and it was a little bit lopsided towards the end. So much so that we changed our plans on how we wanted to do the video, actually. When we planned this out, we had wanted to have the plucky Torians fend off the shadowy Comstar troops. But given how the game went, this was certainly the better way to make it into a story. So. We gave the Comstar pilots names, personalities and coaxed our board gaming friends into recording some dialogue for us. A big thank you for everyone involved, by the way. And as a side note, we use a lot of call signs that already have a representation in the Battletech universe. Some years down the line, someone is going to name a completely new, fresh battle mech, the Pendragon. So for everyone who got confused because we keep calling a Cyclops a Pendragon, I'm sorry. But yeah, there's also a bunch of uh, naval vessels, I believe even Blue Water Navy, that get names from the rest of the round table. Ah, oh well. We decided to go ahead with the call signs anyways, because well, Battletech is a big world and most cool things already found a place there. And Using nods to history and myth is just plain fun. Oh, and whilst we're on the call signs, when we wrote the script for this, we just wrote Percival off as killed in action, just as his colleagues did in the video, but then someone helpfully pointed out that there are rules for automatic ejection, even if a mech experiences a big boom via exploding ammo. That's just a modifier. Not to go into too much detail, but you can find the rules in Tactical Operations, page 196. We might not include a full explanation now, maybe sometime in the future. Anyhow, I tossed the dice for Percival after the game and thanks to absurdly good luck, he survived in the end. Just like all my other guys did. <laughs> I'm a little miffed we couldn't really show off what extraction missions are all about. Yes, the the game went great. The mission worked as intended. But for closer games, the winner would actually be calculated like this. The defending side gets twice the battle value of any attacker destroyed, which is just poor Percival. The attackers get half of that, so one times the battle value of every defender they destroy, but they also get a lump sum of the entirety of the defending force and battle value should they get away with the packet in hand. In this case it didn't really make much of a difference since the defender only killed a single mech and lost pretty much everything in the process. Um, Technically he should still be standing, he might have gotten up. These guys don't. Um, so, yeah, that didn't quite go as we had hoped. But we did get to test the heavy tanks. What's your take on those? The tanks? 
They are very scary. They can fire with reckless abandon every turn since they don't track heat and usually bring enough ammo. Uh, they shrug off a lot of damage as it comes in, but they have fewer hit locations. And those hit locations are hit more consistently than those on mechs since shoot them from the front, it's very likely you're just going to hit the front. And not the arm, the leg, whatever. Yes, and even a hit on the side isn't quite as likely if you shoot from the front. So, less hit locations means it's quicker to get those hit locations destroyed. And have a single hit location destroyed, the whole tank goes kaboom! And even without that, at any moment, crits can happen on tanks, as they are a lot more likely on tanks than on mechs. And every single critical can completely destroy a tank. So, they are very sturdy, they have a lot of firepower, until they pop like balloons. And they can do that at any moment. The best way to deal with the tank is just keep shooting at it, eventually it'll blow up, even if it doesn't seem like you're doing anything, since they are they very rarely lose a weapon or combat effectiveness gradually like a mech would. Yeah. <laughs> at some point in that game I felt like I had no chance because I wasn't doing any visible damage on the tanks and then they all plopped. Also, let me add to the points you just made. During the long period when we edited all of this, we had another game involving tanks. It was a bigger game, six map tiles, five players. Let's just say I'm glad I didn't have to animate any of that. Anyhow, that time I got the command of the heavy tank lance and it kind of corroborated what we saw here. Since the map was bigger, it took a long time to get my short range tanks into position. I didn't have anything like the Shreks there. Um, and one of those was dead in the water right from the start, got an immobilizing hit on the tank threads, first shot at it, and then it was just out of the game even if it wasn't destroyed right until the end. In that game it was actually the lightly armed fast moving hovercraft that caused the real damage for my side. Yes, that game. Well, I learned a lot in that game. For example, that I miscalculated the battle value for our game here. Um, turns out there is a multiplier on the entirety of the battle value. First and foremost, for pilot skill, which didn't come into effect here as they all had the same pilot skill, but would have come into play the last video we made, since the clanners all should have had 1.5 times as much battle value as they did in the end. And here the Torians, since they had the majority, should have had a 1.07 multiplier. Yeah, it didn't really matter and they lost anyway, so who cares, but I wanted to throw that out there. All in all, tanks, great. Very scary, big distraction energy, can cause a lot of damage if used right. Uh, they are no substitute for a more balanced vehicle lance or mech force. All in all though, I think we could fairly say that we're starting to get a hang of how vehicles feel in this game. Yes. And I'm glad you think so, since next video we're learning infantry rules. Oh goody. See you and thanks for watching! Bye!